is your road or bridge racist? You know, there, there's a, a thing some people do, and Pete Buttigieg has always been one of the most notorious culprits of this. You read a book that everyone loves, and then you grab a couple of nuggets out of that book, and you drop them on the cocktail party circuit as if you're the smart person in the room. There is a book about Robert Moses called The Power Broker. It is Robert Caro's biography of Robert Moses. Caro is a brilliant writer. This book is considered one of the top 100 biographies ever written. It won a Pulitzer Prize, and it contains an anecdote that Robert Moses, when he built the highways and bridges around New York City, Robert Moses, for those of you who don't know, was essentially the czar of transportation for New York City. He laid out the whole place. A lot of the designs in New York, from the subway to the bridges to the parkways to the tunnels, Robert Moses deserved a ton of credit for. He constructed playgrounds and sports fields and pools. He built uh, housing developments for the poor. He did all sorts of stuff. But one of the antidotes for the book, and, and Robert Moses, by the way, there's no denying he was racist. He was a racist. But one of the things that Robert Caro says in his book about Robert Moses is that he intentionally designed bridges and roadways to make it difficult for black and Puerto Rican residents of New York to get to certain parts of the city, and in particular, white populated beaches. And it's in the book. Now, if you read the book, you get the evolution of Moses. And the book is all about how power corrupts. And it certainly corrupted Robert Moses at one point in his career, more powerful than either the governor or the mayor of New York. But it's also a highly now disputed anecdote in the book. And further, if you read the rest of the book, uh, you, you get the sense that Moses was more complicated than just your, your run-of-the-mill racist. And there are a lot of people since the book was published who have come out and said this actually isn't true. The reason the bridges on the parkways were lower was to dissuade the uses of any bus. They were parkways. They were scenic byways to route a whole lot of traffic very quickly, a whole lot of cars very quickly while avoiding the city blight on the tour. The bridges were low so that 18-wheelers and buses could not use those. Only cars could use them. It had nothing to do with race. And in fact, a Jones Beach in the New York City area, the white beach that Robert Moses supposedly wanted to keep black people from, had trains and subways where the black people could get on and go. They just didn't. To this day, it's not a beach that is, is commonly used by non-white people. Let me, I will read you quick, uh, part of the passage here in question. Moses began to limit access by buses. He instructed Shapiro to build the bridges across his new parkways low, too low for buses to pass. Bus trips, therefore, had to be made on local roads, making the trips discouragingly long and arduous. For black people, who he considered inherently dirty, there were few further measures. Buses needed permits to interstate parks. Buses chartered by black groups found it very difficult to obtain permits, especially to Moses' beloved Jones Beach. Most were shunted off to parks many miles further on Long Island. And even in those parks, buses carrying black groups were discouraged from using white beach areas, the best beaches, by a system Shapiro called flagging. The handful of black lifeguards, there were only a handful of black employees among the thousands employed by the Long Island State Park Commission, were all stationed at distant, less developed beaches. Moses was convinced that blacks did not like cold water. The temperature of the pool at Jones Beach was deliberately icy to keep black people out. When then-Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt generally raised the issue of the treatment of black Americans to Robert Moses, Robert Carroll writes that Moses put him off and FDR never raised it again. Now, the Shapiro reference, I'm reading now for the Washington Post, 
where even the fact checkers are coming after Pete Buttigieg. Shapiro was Sidney Shapiro, a close Moses associate and former chief engineer and general manager of the Long Island State Park Commission. He was a major source for Caro. The source notes that Shapiro granted 100 hours of interviews with Caro with the understanding that nothing could be used unless he died. In the end notes, Shapiro was listed as the only source for the order to keep the bridges low. But there are problems. Further history has revealed that this wasn't the reason why. A lot of the reason was that it was impossible to have the bridges higher given the geography and landscape. Berwin George, a German professor of sociology, examined the saga and wrote about it and said this couldn't be true. Kenneth Jackson, a Columbia University historian, said generations of his students have failed to be able to confirm it. And others, Thomas Campanella, Cornell University historian of city planning, looked into the issue and said it just couldn't be so. It's just not true. The bridges were made low because of geography, typography, and because Moses actually did want to keep all buses off the parkways and have them focused on cars. But Pete Buttigieg read this in the Carroll book. The Carroll book is well-known, Pulitzer Prize winning one of the top 100 uh, biographies and just embraced it without questioning it. It has been well disputed and, and debunked since then. Even the fact checkers are saying, nah, this really isn't most likely so. But I want you to know a little more. I was a city councilman in Macon, Georgia. In Macon, Georgia, there are two neighborhoods. One is called Shirley Hills. It is a prosperous white neighborhood of mansions. The other is called Pleasant Hill. Pleasant Hill was a middle to upper income black neighborhood. You have heard of some of the people who live in Pleasant Hill. You have probably never heard of people who lived in Shirley Hills. I don't care where you are in North America. You probably know the name Otis Redding. You probably know the name James Brown. Black musicians who came out of Pleasant Hill in Macon, Georgia. In the 1950s, the Georgia Department of Transportation was building I-75 out of Atlanta, south to Florida. And it came to Macon, Georgia. And there was a discussion as to where they should lay the road. And the white neighborhood and the white commissioners and the white planners could have placed the road to navigate around Shirley Hills and Pleasant Hill. They could have done that. Instead, they chose to bulldoze right through the middle of Pleasant Hill and break up the increasingly prosperous black community. It was a decision that was completely, totally based, I shouldn't say totally, but overwhelmingly based on racial issues. To destroy the neighborhood of James Brown and Otis Redding, divided right down the middle. And to this day, Macon, Georgia has racial issues because of the scar that is I-75 and the way it runs. That's just truth. You may not like it, but it's true. There's a house called the Half House. When I was a city council, wanted to save it. Um, it, it never, never was saved. It's called the Half House because the Department of Transportation bulldozed half the house. It was a black family's house. They needed half of the house for the right-of-way. So they bulldozed, cut down half of the house, patched up the open, gaping wound of the house, returned it to the family, and didn't compensate them because they didn't take the house. There was no taking. That house was there for a long time, lived in. That happened. 
we should not deny that there were transportation decisions in this country based on racial motives. There's a problem, though. In postmodernism, as I've told you, the exceptions become the rule. It is the exception that our transportation decisions in this country were based on race. Overwhelmingly, when you look at a lot of these issues, it's based on land cost. And those land costs are indirectly related to, are they well-to-do communities or poor communities? If they're poor communities, they tend to, particularly in the South, be overwhelmingly minority communities. But it has nothing actually to do with race. It has to do with the Constitution requires and the takings clause a fair market reimbursement to the people whose land is taken. And the land is cheaper in poor areas. And so that's where the interstate went to save money. But what Pete Buttigieg and the left are doing is they're taking the exception, transportation decisions made on racial issues, and making that the rule that all of your roads and bridges are racist because a few of them were. And they will revise history accordingly, and we should not let them do that. They've decided they want transportation equity, which is redistribution is nonsense. They essentially are taking socialism and they're calling it equity. When you hear equity, they're talking about socialism. They want to forcibly take from some and give to others. They don't want to make people equal. They want to intentionally, willfully elevate some through government policy over others and claim that, well, we're just righting the wrong. Except to claim they're righting that wrong, they have to revise American history into something it never was. They have to make the exception the rule. Your bridges are not racist, nor are your roads. And to the extent they were, there are exceptions like the half house, where families were never fairly compensated. But in most cases, they were compensated. But the left continues to wring their hands and claim racism about everything in this country because it's all they know at this point. I say often, I don't know what the Republican Party stands for anymore. I was an elected Republican. And I don't really know what the Republican Party stands for anymore other than we're not the Democrats. The problem is that the only thing the Democrats stand for these days is anything they don't like is racist. Most things, the overwhelming majority of things are not racist. But to the Democrats, everything is unless they like it. And the American public has a real hard time embracing the Democratic Party's idea that everything is racist, and they're responding accordingly at the ballot box. 